you know, that I consult for, Larry Laporte, EMA GARP fund. His fund has 44 million and it's all gold and silver miners, but you need a hundred grand to get into it. But I go into Beaver Creek every year with him and he, I was at the Denver show and somebody mentioned Andean and he called me, Don, you like Andean? Last time I looked at Andean was back in March and they only had a 50 million market cap. Well, it jumped to 90 million and now the share price has exploded. So that's a perfect stock for me to wait on. So I was like, it's just, it's just ripped. I mean, if you look at the chart, I think it's just up like 20%. Uh, mm -hmm. people, people are, so people heard about it. I hadn't looked at it since March. So I got, nobody mentioned it on Twitter. So it got ahead of me. But, so basically I'm just going to, that's a stock that I'm going to buy when, after the crash. So you need to find stocks that like that, that you can buy, you know, that you think are a little pricey, you can get a little cheaper. You know, not, all, it's just a few, right? Yeah. Uh, can you give us some- Now that I mentioned it, I'm going to have to pay 10% more. <laughs> What's the ticker on it for our listeners, if you don't mind? Don Durrett, how are you doing? Good, Andy. Thanks for having me back. No, anytime. Thanks for coming on. And what a great time to have an interview about gold, silver, and gold and silver stocks. So let's jump into it here. The Fed came out. The, the, uh, the dot plot was 0.25 to a half anywhere from there. People really didn't know, but I want to say that this, that this is pretty dovish. What say you about what the Fed did? Um, yeah, I thought, I thought they were going to do 25 um, because, you know, the stock market's at an all-time high. It's been really, really strong. And... Um, we're heading into election. Uh, they did 50. They, it, this is one of those ones where they couldn't win because when they do 50, you know, they're going to get basically a lot of flack saying, what do you, and there is, I mean, a lot of people are screaming at them. What are you, what are you doing? What, what was the zero hedge? They, they called it a panic or something. Yep. Zero hedge kind of nailed them pretty hard for doing 50. They, it was kind of a, Lose, lose. I think this is going to be an ongoing thing for them going forward now. they Everything they do is going to get questioned. Nobody's going to think they're doing anything right. I think their decisions are going to get worse and worse. But um, I think they should have been 25 basis points last meeting, and then 25 this meeting, and then 25 the next, and 25 the next. So they, I think they messed up by not doing 25 last time. I mean, why wait and do 50 now when they could have done 25 then? I mean, the data hasn't changed at all. But it doesn't really matter what the Fed is doing. I've been saying this. The Fed was feckless. The Fed is, has a lot of control of the economy because the debt has gotten out of control. So there's nothing that I don't think there's anything that they can do now to restart the economy. So let me back up and defend my comment. We basically, the U.S. economy has been living off of debt since the 1980s, generating GDP by expanding our debt. So our debt has expanded under Reagan from less than $1 trillion to $35 trillion today. We started adding debt at, I think it was $1.8 trillion. Uh, I remember back in 2008, and now we're up to $2 trillion a year. I think it was all less than that in 2008. Basically, debt has started exploding it's been basically on a rampage since the 80s but it really started exploding after the, the gfc in 2008 the great financial crisis that debt has gotten the one the big problem with having that much debt it's it's the crypt the kryptonite is inflation you can't live on debt and then have inflation simultaneously the economy won't work and that's where we're at right now. And so they let the debt get too big. They let the budget deficits get too big. So we're at $2 trillion this year. And it's going to be, I think it's going to be $2 trillion next year. I, you know, Biden basically came out with his budget deficit, raising taxes. Yeah, that's a, a non-starter unless the Democrats win right, both houses. And they want, they want to raise taxes to balance the budget. But I, I think it's a non-starter. We'll see how the election goes. I think um, this... This high debt is basically a recipe for disaster because I don't think they're going to be able to get inflation under control. Now, they say that inflation is at 2%, but we know that 
services inflation is, out, is still out of control. So the average family, they get their these bills in the mail, like their, you know, their, their, their insurance, for instance, is, is exploding higher. Any service bills they're doing, get a car fixed, uh, have a plumber come in. All these things are out of control. You're going, what the heck happened? Property taxes up. So those are up well over 20%. Like grocery bills. And grocery bills, and they're not coming down. So the cost of living is a problem for the economy. It's not, it's not, it's not going to improve anytime soon. And the other thing that the Fed has going against them is the economy is currently slowing. And this rate cut isn't, isn't going to be enough to restart the economy. And they're talking about a 1% rate cut this year. Well, that's not enough. I don't think 2% is enough. So we're looking at, can this economy basically not, and will it stop slowing down over the next six months, 12 months as they lower rates? Will it stop slowing? And if it, if it continues on this path of slowing, then things can get dicey, if you will. That's why I say the Fed's in trouble here, because if they kick in QE, so they're going to cut rates, if kick in QE and try to, kind of speed the economy up, do this so-called soft landing and land the plane, right? They do that, then inflation will kick in gear. And so that's the stagflation. So so there this is really where the hard part begins, is when they cut rates. This is the hard part. Landing the plane's the hard part. You know, they raise rates, they chuck the plane up, they're been way up here in the sky, right? Now they're coming down to land it. it and it's 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 not going to be easy. So I think that Q4, uh, the economy stops growing and we go into recession. And I think the next three years, I, 25, 26, 27, I think are going to be basically a recessionary era. I think 27 is going to be the worst year, if you will. I think 27 is the reset year where everything just, you know, the Fed basically is going to try to print money, QE over the next two years, 25, 26. But I don't think it's going to work. And so it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And then 27, I think all hell breaks loose. I think that's 27 is the crisis year, I believe. So tell me about that. Why 27? And you've been just for our listeners and viewers, you, you've been on record. I want to say you've been on record with me um, with that in the past. But give us a uh, recap. Why is 27 the year? This is really hard to use words. Um, because if I use words, people won't believe me. So I've been researching the future since 1989. Now, the average person can't research the future because it's all woo-woo. And most people don't understand it. It's like it goes over their head. They can't connect the dots. Well, I'm someone who can connect the dots. I have my own website, dondered.com. i actually been writing metaphysical books since 1990. I've written about 10 of them. And I'm I'm a fifth level old soul, so I'm I'm highly advanced spiritually. I actually know more about spirituality than gold and silver. And I'm an expert in gold and silver. Um, so I'm gonna I'll, I'll actually pivot over into into spirituality. I'm around 27 after after basically this market tops out. Um, and so it's people do not understand what's coming um, spiritually, if you will, but the shift. You know, in, in the New Age community, the spiritual community, everybody knows that they call it the Great Shift. I, I call it the transition, and nobody really, re, really know, re, understands what's coming. There's, um, there's this one show. It's the Woo Woo. It's called Gaia Gaia TV, and there's on there something called Initiation, and most people can't watch it. It's total BS. But that that kind of goes into some of the ideas, some of the shifting that's coming, if you will. But, um, yeah, it, it's basically a, what's happening. I mean, this goes all the way back to a book I read in 1989 that got me actually investing in gold. It was a book called Conversation with Nostradamus by Dolores Cannon. And in that, she actually uh, communicated with Nostradamus while he was alive because there's no time isn't linear. Time is simultaneous. So she actually communicated with him when he was alive. And they wrote, they wrote three books together. Now he and he was able to basically see the future and see all these future timelines. And the one thing that he made very clear was that the U.S. 
era, the hegemony era, was going to end during our lifetime. So that was kind of the first, remember, I researched the future, so I kind of started there. So that was kind of the first data point. And that's the reason why I got into gold, because if the U you asked this question, it's, it's a crazy answer. So if the U.S. era is ending, that means the U.S. economy is, is going to have problems. So from that point forward, I knew the U.S. economy was going to have problems. So I got into gold in 1991, I believe it was my first investment into gold, which has paid off well, actually. Yeah. I became a gold bug in 1991. Because so not. And, and so then that was the first data point of the U.S. era ending. And since that time, I've come across a multitude of sources that have basically corroborated what Nostradamus said. And they've all coalesced. So I'll use a lot of these esoteric sources and try to connect the dots. And one of the things that they were saying is that 20, it all kind of started in 2016. That's when, they, 20, you could say 2012, but it was very slow then. 2012 was kind of, a, it was kind of really, really slow. But 2016 is real, when it really started, the, the era of change began. And then 2020 and then 2024. So you have these four year cycles. And so this year, I mean, it seems like this year has been not crazy land, but it has been. But the, the fourth quarter this year is going to be wild. And so then we're going into, so the next three years, the rest of this decade is, is off the charts, basically, as far as change goes. But the U.S. economic system basically coming to an end, if you will, but it's not going to end. Overnight, it's not going to end super, super fast. These things slowly, slowly occur over time. So that's why I'm not predicting a crash in the economy. I'm a cr what I'm predicting is basically a standstill where we stop growing. And once the economy stops growing, then you have slowly, without growth, you have like banks aren't going to be making loans. The so small businesses are going to have trouble. So it's going to be hard to find jobs. It's just going to be, you know, without growth, you have a slow decay, if you will, a steady decay in the economy. And so, and so the next two years are going to be a steady decay, but the, the U.S. economy is so over levered that in 2027, it all basically blows up. Now, I don't know exactly how it blows up because they, the stock market is already going to be in the dumper then, so it can't really crash in there. I don't think a lot of people are going to actually be putting their money in stocks in 27, but I think that we're going to have some type of a reset. In 27, but um, it's going to get really wild the next three years. And I, this has all been building since, like I said, since 1990. I've been studying it care quite carefully for 30 plus years. Got it. So, right now, I guess let's bring it back to right now, then. This is the beginning of the end, then, if you would, uh, yeah. especially with all of the printing that's going to happen. And I was really quite surprised. They share your sentiments. I didn't think, I just thought there was an outside chance the Fed would raise it. I mean, lower it, to, uh, lower it a half a percent, but I thought it more than likely going to be a quarter. That's what all the indicators that I was looking at was showing. But yeah, this is remarkably do dovish. And it looks like, and you've been on Twitter smelling this out, actually posting a lot of this, <laughs> practically. Silver and gold look, especially silver here, they look really good, technically. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, we've been in a four-year correction in the miners. So gold, gold broke out in March, April of this year. And, yeah. And we really haven't seen any pullback. But silver actually has been in correction all summer long. And you you got to have confirmation. I tell everybody, you know, slow down, slow down, like, I got an email today from a CEO saying that, you know, the runway's clear, you know, break out the champagne. I said, I said, no, no, no. We still need two more things to happen. I mean, gold looks fabulous, but gold's been looking fabulous all summer. But the two things we need to happen is we need silver and the miners to join the party. And I've been saying those are the signals that are telling us that the stock market crash is coming. Those, those two da data points, because those data points are basically hold, holding back. I mean, if you look at the uh, H2I, it's, it's at 322 today. We haven't got to 330, but I think we got to get to 340, 350 before the miners are actually, have actually broken out. 
I've been saying this, 340 on the HUI and 55 on Newmont. We get above those levels, then we're probably going to run to 400 on the HUI. And that's when the bull market and the miners basically comes back. Now, if you go back to 2020, the HUI was at 360. So we haven't even reverted back yet yeah. to the correction, the cycle high correction in 2020 in the miners. And silver, like I said, if silver's been in a correction, we were at 32 back in May. And we haven't touched 32 cents. And yeah. we're, 30, we're actually under 30 today, 29.93, under 30 on the spot on silver. We're $2 down, which is almost 10%. What is it, 8%? We're at eight, we're eight percent correction here on silver on the on the May site last night cycle high, so silver and the miners are still giving you pause and saying no, we're not broken out yet, and I think those are basically telling us, you know, for people that are throwing a lot of money in and saying okay, this is you know like let's say you had a hundred grand on the sidelines, and you're waiting to put it in on the breakout, if you put in a hundred grand, you're probably going to be underwater. 10 to 20 percent when this when the stock market finally rolls over and crashes because if you i I posted this like five times uh over the last few days this chart of the s p and gold Mm -hmm. it has been unbelievable how gold and the s p have traded one to one this year i mean just and today's a good example the s p you know it broke out early and gold broke out early gold was up today I don't know how much, and it's right. it down 25 bucks. I mean, I'm, so it basically just followed the market. The market was up, and then Pal talked, and the market went down. Gold followed Gold followed the market up. Pal talked, the market went down, gold went down. It's like one to one. That correlation is totally telling us that the miners in gold are going to go down with this market. The question is, how much do they go down? But they are going to go down. You know, some people say that 2400 is going to hold on gold. And I've been saying the odds are not good that it holds. I think that 2300 could hold. My target's 2250 um, on gold. So that means we're going down 10%. And that means the miners are going down 10%. Now, that said, I'm pretty much fully invested in the miners. I'll take the 10% hit. I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm risk averse. I don't mind these 10% corrections, but a lot of people don't like it. They put in 100 grand, you're down. You're down to ninety thousand, eighty thousand in a heartbeat. You're, you know, you're angry because you know most people can't handle that kind of, you know, going underwater like that. Um, so it's it's difficult to time the market. Mm-hmm. So I I try not to do it. I don't think that you can say that the miners are trending up and and will continue to trend up the rest of this year. The only way that I see that happening is we get. A couple, either one or two things happens. Number one, the BRICS in October announced that they're going to have a new currency that's backed by gold. And the rumor is they're going to back it by forty percent gold. If that happened, gold probably jump a hundred bucks and probably would never would not go below twenty four hundred. That's number one. The second thing that could happen would be some type of a black swan that just scares the hell out of you, yeah, and pops a you know hundred hundred bucks at it because of the fear trade kicking in. But other, but those are those are Small possibilities. I, you know, bricks maybe fifteen percent, blacks one five percent. So you got eighty percent chance that the, the miners are going back down ten percent. So what you want to do under that scenario is you want to pick out, you know, a few stocks like one to five stocks you want to buy the dip on. You want to buy them a little cheaper. Um, like today, I, I found a stock today, um, Andean Silver, that slipped through my fingers. Uh, the guy that, you know. That I consult for Larry Laporte, EMA Garp Fund. His fund has forty-four million, and it's all gold and silver miners. But you need a hundred grand to get into it. But I go to Beaver Creek every year with him, and he I was at the Denver show, and somebody mentioned Andean, and he called me, Don. You like Andean? Last time I looked at Andean was back in March, and they only had a fifty million market cap. Well, it jumped to ninety million, and now the share price has exploded. So. That's a perfect stock for me to wait on. So I was like, it's just, it's just ripped. I mean, if you look at the chart, I think it's just up like 20%. Uh, mm-hmm. people are, so people heard about it. I hadn't looked at it since March. So I got, nobody mentioned it on Twitter. So it got ahead of me. But, so basically, I'm just going to, that's a stock that I'm going to buy when, after the crash. So you need to find stocks that like that, that you can buy. 
you know, the, you think are a little pricey, you can get a little cheaper. You know, not all, it's just a few, right? Yeah. Uh, can you give us some? Now that I mentioned it, I'm going to have to pay 10% more. <laughs> What's the ticker on it for our listeners, if you don't mind? Uh, ASL, it only trades in Australia. So that gives me a, an inch, uh, something for Australian stock. You know, most people won't buy Australian stocks on US based mortgage brokerages because they have to pay too much money. So what you want to do is you want to use uh, interactive brokers yep. and they buy the stocks using Australian dollars. It, 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 I really like interactive brokers. And you can also buy Canadian stocks in the Canadian exchange in Canadian dollars and in London exchange in pounds. And it, it works fabulous. So if you want to buy Australian stocks, use interactive brokers. They should send me a check. Yeah. Well, I use interactive brokers as well. They should send us both a check. Um, so you were, let's go, let's go there. You were at Beaver Creek. Uh, what was the mood like there? And uh, was there any companies that stood out uh, when you were there? Um, yeah, the mood, the, other- yeah, the mood on the whole was definitely positive. I mean, gold was that during that week, gold was ripping. Yeah. Uh, it was ripping that week and stocks were up and everybody was kind of excited. Simultaneously, that a lot of companies were still, you know, not happy with the state, the sector, because it's hard to raise money. Most of these stocks are way underwater. I mean, they're trading at you know, pennies on the dollar. So a lot of people are complaining about valuations. So it was a cross current, right? Now, as far as stocks that I liked, um, it's too bad. I mean, if we would have done this tomorrow or the next day, I could have actually mentioned some stocks, but I haven't done my, the stocks I like the most, not all of them, I can mention some today, but some of the stocks I like the most are going to be in my part two. I tweet, I tweeted out my notes in Beaver Creek and my part two on Twitter, my, in my community, you know, I, I tweeted it out everywhere. Um, it's the part two I, I have to hold back on because the guy that I, the EMA Garfield, they're, buying, they're adding shares. So I got to wait for them to fill, fill their orders. And so once they do that, I'll release the second one. And I actually have best of show. I have four stocks that are best of show and uh, four stocks that are runner up. So I list eight stocks that I basically like. There were three stocks. Um, Three stocks that I really liked. I'm gonna hold. I'm not gonna say them here because I'm gonna wait and post it. Because if I say them here, people, you know, it's like, wait a minute. Yeah. Everybody gets it at the same time. But there were three stocks that surprised me that I was really excited. Um, so, and so those three stocks will be written up and mentioned in my article. But so stocks that I. But I can mention a few that were in my first post that I thought were, you know, really, really strong. Uh, one of them was Next Gold. Their development story up in Canada it used to be Treasury Metals. I mean, this thing, they've been trying to develop this project for like 10 years. But now we can finally see the finish line. And they brought in Frank Gustra. He owns, as a strategic shareholder, he owns 11%. So now they are, they are primed for building this mine. So I... I think Next Gold is one of the better development stories. Um, Hummingbird Resources, this is a high risk stock. You really don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. I mean, management um, is not great. Management's made a lot of mistakes. Most people, you know, they want to bet on people, but they're going to be, and you might want to hold off on this. I've said it in my write up. I said, this is a really high risk stock, but it has a big reward if, if, if they can pull off what they're trying to do. So they have a $44 million, $45 million debt payment this year in October, but their, their bankers are their largest shareholder. Plus they're trying to sell their Dugby project to get 35 million you know, to pay that off. But their free cash flow, they're growing if they can not have problems. Next year, they're going to be a 200,000 ounce producer. So if gold's at, if gold's at 2,500, they're going to generate over $100 million in free cash flow. Plus, their, their ASIC is not super high. Gosh. 1650 or 1700 But at $2,500 gold, they're going to generate over $100 million in free cash flow. They're pretty money. Or yeah. Gold. So it, it's, it's going to be hard for them to screw it up because the mines are already in production. And so all they have to do is keep them running. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, it's, it's, it's an interesting story, a high risk, but... One thing I like about it is by 
May, June of next year, we're going to know if basically, because by then they should have generated about 50 million of free cash flow. So if we get to May, June and goals at 2,500 plus, and they report a good quarter, they fix their problems, um, looks good. Well, I'm just, uh, Go Gold um, is, you know, one of my favorite development stories down in Mexico. They just have, you know, their CapEx isn't, both of their projects is high, like a lot of these companies are, um, and they're low cost, low ASIC, ten dollar ASIC for silver. So they're going, they're they're going to generate a lot of free cash flow. They're cheap. I just, I love I love go gold. Um, Artemis Silver. I mean, shoot, Aftermath Silver. Um, this one, this one, this is one of the ones that surprised me. That I one of the three companies that surprised me. And I bet I wrote it up in my last one. So Aftermath, they have, they're currently calling it a manganese because the revenue on manganese farly outstrips the silver production. But Berengala has 140 million ounces of silver at about oh. three ounces per ton. So if you, if you consider it a silver mine, the cash cost will be negative. So the free cash flow on this thing is just absolutely incredible. So. So the manganese, the battery quality now, all, so far, all the, all the testing they've done in metallurgy shows that their manganese is, is battery quality, which is right now running about $2,000 a ton, $2,000 a ton. So that's basically a head grade. If you convert it to gold, two-thirds of an ounce, but more than two-thirds of an ounce. I mean, it's one of the highest, but that doesn't even include, when you include the rest of their metals, because they have copper, a lot of silver. So if silver's at, they say forty, that's another hundred and twenty bucks, and then they're copper. But you're, we're looking at you know, very close to a head grade gold equivalent of at one ounce per ton, which is phenomenal. And so, uh, Eric Sprague, uh, he just did. Uh, he added he, out basically based on the presentation at Beaver Creek. Eric's brought about uh, five, put another five million in it, and now it's nineteen percent. So I don't think my biggest worry on aftermath was that they would sell this project because it's so valuable. Uh, prior to building it, just take the you know the easy money and run. But now that Eric Sprott has nineteen percent, um, I don't know if they're going. I don't think they're going to sell this thing early. And so that one was one of the ones that shocked me. But what? Thank you. Do we want to keep talking about stocks or we want to move on? I would love to. <laughs> you want to talk more? Yeah, let's talk more All about right, we'll get Okay, let's go another one. The next one, uh, expiration stocks. So on my expiration, I don't have that many. I have like 65 stocks here on my, my favorites list on GSD. And I only have, uh, I had four uh, expirations. And one of them I'm going to talk about, which is Banyan. So Banyan Gold. Tudor, Free Gold Ventures, Southern Silver. And these are basically all large deposits that are valued at pennies on the dollar. So I added a fifth one at Beaver Creek. It was collective mining. They think they have at least 15 million ounces of gold. It's all economic. So I added collective. But the one I was going to talk about was Banyan. Banyan's trading about 49 million right now. I mean, they call it 50. They have 7 million ounces already, which would be about $7, but I think they're going to find at least eight. So that takes it to $6 an ounce. So you're paying $6 an ounce. I mean, you can't beat that with a stick, right? So as long yeah. as they're patient, I don't think they would sell below 30. So that's a four bagger if they just wait till 30. And if they wait till 50, 60, 70, they're patient. And I'm hoping Tara owns, the CEO owns 4%. So I'm hoping she's patient. And I'm hoping they, sell, they don't sell below 50. So they go to 50 year to five plus bagger. So all of these, all, I just love these, these optionality plays. Okay. That's it for stocks. <laughs> oh, thank you for those. Well, thank you for those. Um, okay. Let's go back to uh, real quick. Well, by the way, you're going to be at, uh, you're going to be in Florida in October. That's yeah, right. I'm speaking at the Commodity Global Expo in October. Yes. And you need to be an accredited investor to get in. Otherwise, it's 600 bucks. Yeah. Well, I will be there. And cool. uh, I am 
I'm doing media there and I will, I would love to interview you while we're oh, there. Cool. Yeah. That sounds great. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know what? Let's end on that then. Well, let's end on what between now and October, that's what I'm going to see and talk with you next. What do investors or speculators need to just be aware of? What do people need to be aware of? We got probably four weeks here. Is yeah. Big, so no? I, I already went over that, which I basically said that I think the economy is, mm -hmm. is basically going to stop growing in Q4. So the markets are going to sniff that out, I think. And so I think gold will go down with the markets initially, um, at least 10%. And then once it bounces, once gold basically bounces and everybody realizes it's bouncing, it's not coming back down, that gold is telling the real story and, it's, and we're going to get a decoupling event. Once that decoupling event get, comes in, I think that's going to be your last chance to buy gold miners and silver miners for cheap. Because I think after, after it bounces there, I think we're going to rip, we'll rip to say a 400 HUI by the end of the year. Now it's, you can predict the future. I'm just, everybody's sure. getting, but that's my expectation that once gold bounces, that you're going to see this, 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 you know, ending the year, gold and silver and the miners all ending the year are basically on an upswing and with a, this decoupling event that I'm expecting. So the gold uh, 2580. So if you do 10%, it's 258. So that's, you know, right around 2300. Silver is at 30, 10% takes you down in the 27s. Right. But I think silver will overshoot. I don't think 27 will hold up. Silver usually overshoots. It's more volatile. So my range there is 25 to 27. But I do think, I'm not expecting gold to go below 2200. I, I think that's the floor. Um, the HUI, 326. My, my target for the HUI was 260, 263. I don't think we're going to go down there, but I think 280s is definitely in play, maybe 270s. And so, I mean, I basically said that oil's going in the 60s and we're in the 60s now. I think oil's going to go in the low 60s before it bottoms out here. So the 10 year um, up a little bit today, 37. That was interesting. I, I was interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was going to go lower. And, I, I think in the dollar, um, yeah, so I think the dollar in the 10-year, I, I don't think people really have a real good feel for where that's going. I think they're both going lower, but in the near term, they might go up a little higher. Yeah. And then I think that pretty much covers it. Um, we didn't really go into the economy and all, all what's slowing it. A lot of that's boring, but it, it really comes down to employment and, and, and consumer spending, really. Those are, those are the two data points. But I think that um, there isn't really any sectors that are going to grow, that are showing solid, solid growth. So it's it's going to be really hard for the stock market to grow here. I know David Hunter said they're going to cut rates and then our, and the stock market is going to explode higher. That's a possibility, but I just don't see any sectors in the economy benefiting that much from this rate cut and, or, you know, anything going. I mean, Retail sales has basically been flat for the year when you adjust for, adjust for inflation. And I think the reason why is because they're having to spend so much money on services. Mm -hmm. They don't have the money for retail. And so I, I don't see, so retail's, you know, flat. It's basically dead, if you will. Um, you, if you're not growing, you're dying kind of thing. And so I don't see anything. I don't see any green shoots. I don't see any pickup. So. It's going to be hard for the for the stock market now. The stock market this year, I mean, one of the reasons why it's been so strong is this anticipation of rate cuts. Well, the anticipation of rate cuts is over. Right, it's here. Now and now now the economy's got to do got to show us its stuff, right? Yeah. And there's no stuff there. Yeah. Where's the beef, you know? There's yeah. no And so I think the economy's in trouble here. That's why I say um, well, Q4 is going to be wild when everybody realizes you know, it's like you have to come out, you know, you're in your bubble and you have to come outside and look and see what's really happening. It's like, uh oh. Yeah. How how does how do we get the economy growing again? Uh oh, uh oh, there's nothing there. Yeah. And so we'll see. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good finish on.
Real quick, when can they uh, people expect on Twitter? You said tomorrow or the next day with your uh, your note, your your second part, part of your notes. Yeah, part two. It depends. Um, you know, it might. I I really can't say if it's going to be this week or next week. It could be. Stay today. tuned. It could be today. Uh, it could be today. It could be next Monday. It just depends. There might be one. Because I don't want to, I don't want to do part three. I want to do it all. So there could be yeah. one one stock that they're waiting on, and they want me to hold off until they get it filled. Got it. And so, well, I'll just tell people to stay tuned. Follow you on Twitter. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I'm not, well, well, one thing they can do to make it real easy is I have a Substack that that's free. So you can either you can do Substack free or you can pay the monthly kind of support my writing with some of the some of the paid you get extra stuff but if you do my sub stack for free any post any significant post that i do on twitter you will get emailed that's the thing that's cool about Substack. you get you get emailed for anything i post and this will be something you will get emailed so there's a reason for you to join free on Substack. stack uh, the other thing that's cool about Substack is my i do a friday and a midweek recap mm -hmm. You get those emailed to you on Substack, Got which it. is pretty cool. I mean, yeah. I don't know why. Um, I think Twitter eventually, you know, why doesn't Twitter allow you, allow people to get emails? I mean, they can get notified, but why not? Why don't they send, I guess it's a pain in the butt to send out, but Substack does. They can send out emails for certain people, like, you know, send, send me an email of Don's post, right? And then I can yeah. go on Twitter and read them. But they don't. They don't offer that. Yeah. I think the reason why is a pain. Email's not easy to do, so they probably say it's a pain in the butt. But like I say, Substack does it, so they, they should do it. Yeah, I'll tell the Elon next time I see him. <laughs> Don, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, goldstockdata.com. What's your uh, Substack uh, URL? Just Don Durrett. Yeah, just do go to Substack, search for Don Durrett. One thing about, um, yeah, my website. So my website, it, it really isn't for stock picking. It's more for people that already own gold and silver miners and are looking for, you know, data or leads on others. They can do their own research. We created this website for investors. So you could go and, you know, do some, do your own research. I do provide lists, but I still want you to know what you're doing. So if you don't own any gold, silver, then read my book. It's a textbook on how to analyze gold and silver. So after you read the book, then you can decide if you want to do it or not. You can dip your toe in. Yeah. And where can, where can people find the book? Uh, yeah, you can find it on Amazon. Just um, go to Amazon and do Don Durrett, and you'll find the gold, gold and silver. Excellent. Don, always a pleasure, and uh, I'll see you in Florida. Awesome. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Bye-bye.